Okay, should get started. Um, just to remind everyone, again, welcome. Um, the meeting is recorded, so just be aware of that. Um, so for today's meeting, um, this is what the agenda looks like. I'm going to give a very brief intro, it's not going to take 10 minutes. Um, and then I'll give the team an update and some of the assays and stuff that were done to aid selection of some of the lead compounds from one of the series. Um, then we're going to get some assay updates from Alex. And then we're going to get open the floor for discussion. I mean, today's going to be a very short meeting, so it shouldn't be too long. Introduction to the nice summer weather, so I wouldn't hold it too long. <laughs> All right. Um, yep, yeah, so what I thought I'll do is begin with some of the actionables we had and give people an update as to where things are. Um, one of the ongoing items we had was the follow up. Hi. The slides aren't moving on. You're not moving the slides on. I'm not seeing the updated slide. I'm just oh. seeing, still seeing the front slide. Mm. Oh. Share the screen. Um, That's better. Thank you. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'll see if I got a full screen. It doesn't work. Try again. Try going. Yeah. Uh, try again. Can you see that now? Yeah, that's fine for me. Okay. So you just feel like you think? Okay, so what I thought I'll do is I'll give you an update. So we had this follow-up study with FOP. We had done the FOP efficacy at 100 megs per kg. We had decided to follow up with a lower dose, 50 megs. Um, that data is a little bit slow in coming. Um, they had to expand the number of animals in the group, so you know, maybe we have to wait a little bit longer to get some of that data. Okay, so we'll update the team as that data comes in. Um, the other thing of interest, again, one of the Achilles heel for the project is to um, try and identify some potential combinations with ALTO inhibition, bearing in mind that the disease is quite heterogeneous. Um, Jerome have started some combo studies. We've done half of it. Um, he's not at the meeting today, but he didn't get a chance to follow up with the second half. So he said he would give us an update and that's complete. Um, we had also sent some compounds to Julia. I mean, I don't know if Julia is on the line, but you know, we haven't gotten any data from Julia yet. You know, she was planning on putting some of those compounds. <laughs> Hello? And Julia was planning on putting some of those compounds in her um, cell lines to see if they're going to be working in the 3D models. Um, so a lot of that work is still ongoing for combinations. What's also exciting too is we're we trying to establish um, which of the VIPG cell lines are truly dependent on R2. Um, and if any of these cell lines can be engrafted in animals, that would truly help the role of um, R2 in some of these animal models. I mean, that's one of the challenges right now is which of the DIPG cell lines that we have are truly dependent on R2. And so we're trying a couple of techniques um, using chemical protect strategy, and we'll get some update from um, Alex. Alex has started looking into exploring some of these projects and see what they're doing in cells. Um, the other important part of the project is going to be doing some efficacy models with some of the lead compounds. And so we have Chris Jones, Angel, Jerome, Haval, and Julia have all been looking into this. And Angel has already sent us um, a design protocol for studying 2009. Chris Jones, we are still waiting on um, some protocol details on Chris Jones. He might end up testing the Belcher model instead. Mm -hmm. So, but we're excited that um, Angel have already received compounds and he's ready to go. So looking forward to some of that data. Um, 
Last month, we told you we're going to profile some compounds. We're waiting on data from SIP and PK, so I'm going to give you an update on some of that, where that is. And also a little update on where we are with some of the backup blueprints. <laughs> okay, um, you know, for a lot of you who probably knew, joining, I kind of thought it would be good to just remind the group, again, the disease indication for which we are, you know, targeting for ALTO. Inhibition, particularly going after ALTO mutation, we, everybody is aware that FOP is really an ALTO germ disease, it's a causal effect. We have the DIPG, which is a little bit more complicated, that's the one we have chosen to take on. It's an area of great need. But there's also some other disease, like anemia of chronic disease is also a disease that also has an ALTO component to it. And as I mentioned last month, this is um, an asset we might be able to use to how PD, you know, characterizing some of the PD profile for some of our compounds and some of the other models like FOP, even though they're driven by R2, they are more complicated models to wait a long time to really test a lot of compounds. So if we can get this R2 PD model up and running, that would actually help. Um, Alex did mention you need a little bit of R3 activity last month. So I think some of our compounds have enough R3 activity to be able to show activity Sorry, in the the slides haven't moved on again. Well, yeah, it looks like there's a delay. Maybe I just keep it on a... Really, it off the full screen. Can you see that now? I can, I can see this slide, it, but that happened last time, but it, it's still not full screen. Yeah, whenever I go to full... It looks like when I change my slide on full screen, it delays. I think that's probably what's happening. Yes, you just flip okay. back. It's never been on full screen. It's always been this no. view. Yeah. yeah. And the, uh, are the slides moving on for you, Alex? No, I, I'm with you, Sue. Yeah. Um, well, just you just go from this this for now. It's obviously we're having problems sharing one the full screen, so we'll, we'll do this. It's pretty. Is this all legible for you online? Maybe you could just shout when you're changing screen, and then we know if it's working. Okay. So some of it, a few of the slides are animated, so, okay, I'll do that and let me know if it changes. That's another bad idea. Okay, you can see that now? You're on the out to mutations in diseases slide. Yes. Slide four, yeah. Yeah. I'm on, I'm on that slide. Okay. But they're not seeing it full size. Yeah. Are you seeing the full screen? No. Mm. I'm curious. So I think maybe you share your laptop, not the... Mm. And? Is your laptop full screen? No, my laptop is. So I think it's sharing your laptop, not the actual projection. Oh. <clears throat> okay. That sounds correct. Yes. Is that something that's easily fixable? Or just. I think maybe. Well, we'll figure it out another day. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, keep, let's keep moving through. Yeah. We'll, with, uh, we'll go, uh, go back to the non full screen. Non full screen? Okay, let's do the non full screen. Okay. Okay, so the next slide, so these are three diseases I've introduced in terms of what's driven by R2. And now um, more recently, <laughs> there seem to be an um, interest in R2 mutations in Alzheimer's. And so we got a recent request from Dr. Holtzman, who is at Washington State University um, of Medicine in St. Louis. So he, he studies um, Alzheimer's disease, looking at these LDR expression in the APOE4 model, and apparently R2 inhibitors are a hit, so he has actually reached out to us and find out if he can test some of our CNS penetrant R2 inhibitors in his model. So I thought this was very exciting, because one of the challenges, you know, there are many CNS penetrant R2 inhibitors out there, so he mm. might have a few of those that he might be able to test. Um, it might be good to actually, maybe at the next meeting, to invite him to kind of give us an update, yeah. some of his data. So right now we're trying to just get MTAs and stuff established with him so we can share material and get some of that going. But this would be exciting to see what data he has and for him to test 209, which we have done. So. All right. So with, the, <clears throat> with that backdrop in terms of disease, then kind of wanted to remind the group here we were with 209 and its profile. So we thought 209 is a very strong candidate. We have it scaled up, it's ready to go. 
And then there were two features we thought if we could improve those, you know, we'll have even better candidates. So these features were where basically if you could improve the half-life a little bit. And also there were some concerns about the health profile as I have highlighted here. So what we had done is we went back and we started doing SAR to see if we can identify candidates that could lead to the improvement of those two features. And so I have highlighted here 2009 in yellow, that's a strong lead candidate. And then next to that is the six backup leads that we kind of selected. And part of the driver for that was based on some of the herb profiling we had done. So you could see 2117, 2143, those compounds actually still had very similar herb value, but we had loved those compounds because there was some element of structural diversity in them. You could see 214, we have that little quinoline, it's a little different. And um, 2117, you could see we had gone from the pipirizine to this n methyl pipirizine. And they all had very decent potency at the target. The herb profile didn't get much better, but you'll see some of the other features that I'll show you soon that made them attractive. And so what I've done in these slides is I've tried to highlight the sections of the new molecules that are distinct from 2009, most of all up as a non-chemist, if it makes any sense. So for the three compounds on top, like as I said, they were decent compounds, they were structurally distinct, and we really like those <laughs> differences. Now, the three compounds on the bottom really just one of the lingering issues in the project, which was the herb profile. And so that change demanded that we switch the trimethoxy group to this methoxyfluor amide benzyl system. And so that change, structural change, seems to really you know, alleviate the herb liability significantly. All of the efforts we had done on the pepirizine side of the molecule actually still retain a lot of herb. It looks like it's harder to do that on the pyrazine right, to alleviate the herb issue. So this was a short list of additional compounds in addition to 2009 that we thought was worth further profiling for mouse PK, for BBB, for SIP, and for broad selectivity. Okay, so to kind of walk you slowly to some of the data that we have in PK, and I'm also trying to highlight some of the features in the profile that we thought make some of these molecules stand out from others. And so you could see I have here this table along with the target product profile. And so you could see 2009, again, had a very, very decent profile, like as I say, other than its herc and the half-life. And so 2117 and 2143, some of the features that we found attractive was, again, we had like the improvement in selectivity over alpha, which we think is a potential liability. Um, we saw improvement in the half-lives, going from two to four and five hours in mouse, so that was nice. What was also exciting is the brain penetration at four hours. We do this quick at 10 mix per kg, we just assess plasma and brain exposure. And so we saw this improvement in brain exposure for both 2117 and 2143 when we did the picking. And so we're quite happy. So we're getting decent exposures, we're getting good BBB penetration. And even for 2143, that improvement in volume of distribution was an interesting profile we thought worth monitoring. So those were some of the features for those two compounds that we thought made them very attractive from a picky perspective and brain penetration. So for the other, the other compounds that we evaluated in PK, highlighted in the next slide here. And so 2214, that was one of those structurally distinct quinoline compounds that we had actually liked. But unfortunately, that compound actually had the worst PK profile. So that sort of started eliminating that compound and we evaluated it in mouse. Um, the other three compounds, which were amides, <laughs> I mentioned to you, they had decent profile in terms of selectivity over ALK5, uh, particularly 234. The selectivity profile was also interesting. It only hit, of the 374 kinases you screen, it only hit three other kinases. And so that was quite exciting to see. More important, we saw the improvement in HERG. And so when we did the PICA profile, you could see, I mean, the profile is 
not as good in terms of its clearance relative to 009, but it's still decent. We got decent exposure. The brain penetration was almost similar to um, 2009. So we thought 234 was an exciting candidate based on its picket profile. Um, the two other AMIs, 236 and 2238, they had slightly lower BBB penetration, but 2236 actually had a strong, other than its BBB penetration, which was about 20% on the edge, its other profile was very strong. So we thought, okay, let's see what, you know, the additional features like SIP and stuff would look like. Okay, so we're quite happy with the PK profiling. I mean, other than 2114, the other compounds were quite decent except we had to keep an eye on the BBB penetration for 3.6 and 3.8, but you know, 3.6 you know, had a good profile overall. So then we did the SIP profiling for this compound, and immediately it stood out that 2.143, which we had liked quite a bit, it had that strong volume of distribution, it had that nice structurally distinct feature, and all of a sudden we start realizing that it's picking up a lot of SIP. It's hitting 2.9 really hard, 2C19 and 3A4. And so, you know, I mean, that becomes a problem with drug drug interaction going forward. And we we are seriously thinking that a COP like this would need combination. So, you know, you want to avoid drug drug interaction. So that eliminated 2143. So, that was, you know, even though 2143 had a strong profile, it was unfortunate that this profiling was so bad. And so, on the next slide, then, to the process of elimination. So based on the selectivity profiling, the SIP profiling, and the PK, I mean, this was actually animated. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone pretend that things are coming and going. They won't <laughs> see it online. <laughs> Let me see. If, can you see that? Can everyone see that? Can see that one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the point I wanted to make is, you know, when we go back to the list, what we call it, you know, this dashboard list of compounds, so you got 2009, and then I just showed you some of the profiling of all of the candidates that we have done from PK, BBB, SIP profiling. And so, to the process of elimination, you could see that 2143 was eliminated because of its SIP profile. 2214 was eliminated because of its poor PK. And now two to three A, we thought, you know, if you're gonna pick any one of the two, we probably go with two to three six or eliminate it um, two three A based on its poor BBB. I mean. So that's the process of elimination we use. I mean, I don't know if others had actually thoughts of other compounds that they would have liked or they would have actually done this way mm -hmm. process of elimination. But in the end we thought that these four compounds were interesting enough compounds wanting to profile a little bit further in terms of the tolerability and stuff like that and scalability. Any questions so far in terms of how we went about picking these? Any comments? Any suggestions? Any recommendation? Any disagreements? I just want to make one thing clear. These are these are the four from this period. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, I know the people at Charles River have been working very hard. On I'm, I'm talking. I'm, yeah, that's that. coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's coming up. Sure yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. not including any yeah, other yeah, work yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Medford, this yeah. is not getting. I was just going to ask if 2117 had something special about it because it otherwise looks a bit similar to 2009. The others have the HERG advantage, but 117. Yeah, so if I go to the next slide, you're going to see where those features stand out. Okay. So here are the four compounds fully profiled. What we like about 2117, it's a lot more brain penetrant. And so okay. one of the things we we'll, one of the things I learned recently um, is from a clinician who is actually working in DIPG. When they summarize some of the challenges that people with DIPG therapy face and some of the limitations of uh, the drugs that's being used, there seems to be a serious issue with not only just penetrating the brain, but penetrating the pond where the disease actually arises. Apparently, the pond, the BBB barrier around the pond is a lot tighter than the general BBB to get into the brain. Mm -hmm. So you kind of want to maximize your CNS BBB penetration in order to get access to where the disease actually is. So we believe compounds like 2117 actually increases that chance even more in terms of getting access to the pond. So that's a feature we like. Now, 
you're going to see, I mean, as we, these were the BBB penetration that we did, dosing these compounds at 10 mix per kg. And you're going to see later on, when, it, when we took like 2009, and we start dose escalating at some of the higher saturating dose, the BBB penetration actually got better. I mean, so, I mean, you need to have enough BBB penetration at least to give you confidence that you're going to get good brain distribution. One thing so, I also like is the half life. Is, uh, yes, it's, 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 cool. it's That's one, one. Yeah, that's another point that was just made by Ahmed too. Uh, Nicole is the half life is also better. Yeah, than, I can take that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Sorry, are you just looking on your brain penetration? You're just looking at total concentrations, or are you looking at unbound concentrations? Yeah, we haven't done unbound and CSF data yet. I mean, that's actually going to be one of the obvious next steps. For these lead compounds, we're going to probably need a lot more detailed brain information. Yeah. yeah. So everyone online so, has seen the full, full screen lead candidates. That's what we're looking at right now. That's yeah. what we have up here. Yeah. So, uh, Alex, that's what you're seeing as well? Yeah. We only see the slide you're presenting about quarter scale because you're on presenter view. So we okay. see two slides at once. Okay, I could go back. I'm going to go now go back to because of that last slide was animated. I'm now going to go back to the non full screen mode. That's better. Okay, so yeah, so I saw, you know, now with the four compounds that were selected, this is kind of a snapshot of the full profile. I mean, we decided to now see if we can get a little bit more data on these four compounds to push them. I mean, Nicole did ask a good question. Are there any other questions about some of the other candidates? Yeah, no, the burning questions. Okay, so the team agrees. So from this papyridine series, we thought these were very, very good candidates based on some of the most profiles, the profile and the board selectivity going forward. So then the next step now is how are these com cell compounds looking in the IPD cell line? Because one of the key next steps is to start looking at efficacy in in vivo in a tumor model. And everybody knows that, I mean, the IPD is not a lot of good models right now. We have a number of DIPG cell lines. We are de devoting a lot of effort into understanding which of those cell lines are ALT dependent. But one of the other challenges in addition to ALT dependency is that not everything that DIPG line from primary patients are ingraffable in mouse, and so that remains a challenge. And so we are looking for cell line that we you know hopefully is dependent and you can engraft. I mean, that's the best case scenario. But in some cases, you have some compounds, some cell lines that actually either might be partial or not dependent on how to, but they engraft very well. And so, I mean, it's something, it's um, kind of an elephant in the room. We're going to actually discuss it a little bit in terms of which model is the most ideal model for efficacy, <laughs> you know, going forward. But I mean, if, you know, on the next slide, what I wanted to show now, I mean, since I've been on this project for quite some time, I mean, I'm now fully convinced, even though we don't have all of the pieces together yet, just based on this structural diversity in all of the alto ligands you've looked at, the only two are the dependent lines based on chemistry profile for ligands, to me, is the DIPG21. So I think that just needs to be formed up with knockdown data and now Hopefully, if we find good protact compounds, it can chemically knock out the target. Just to convince people so far that this seems to be the only alto dependent line. And, and so that's why I just wanted to flash this word from John for again to remind people, you know, we had taken the two compounds on the bottom were alto dead compounds that are dead in the, um, the DIPD21 line. All of the alto active compounds are also active in the cell line. Now you cannot say that, say that for any of the other um, DIPD cell lines that we have profiled so far. So I'm fully confident that, you know, DIPG21 is likely to be an alto dependent line. Um, so if this can be engrafted, I mean, somebody could win a million dollars. <laughs> you know, so I think that's one of the challenges right now. If you can get engraftment of this line, that would be an ideal preclinical model for driving home the point that AL2 is a driver of some DIPG disease that are AL2 dependent. So with that profile as a reminder, um, I should also mention the other line that we've also looked at quite a bit is the line next to it, which is the 
DIPD0079. So you could see there is some sensitivity of some of the compounds in this line. There's still a debate whether that's truly an alpha dependent line because there's a lot of other lesions in it. And it appears the kinase in addition to its histone mutation. But fortunately, this is one of the lines that engrafts well, and we can actually do orthotopic xenografts. So you're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place in terms of wanting to demonstrate efficacy in vivo and going with an engraftable line versus picking a cell line that's alpha dependent, but yet unfortunately not engraftable. So you now when you take that data set and you know look at the lead compounds and how do they look in those two lines of interest? So you could see very clearly two zero zero nine one one seven, they're all very potent in the sensitive alpha dependent line, as expected. So very, very good sub one hundred nanomolar potency. Um however when we go to the engraphable line, which is the DIPD zero zero seven. Uh, 2009 is still very active in that cell line. That's why we're actually advancing that to an in vivo efficacy model, just to demonstrate that we can actually shrink at the IPG tumor in vivo. But you could see the other compounds which are very potent at R2 are actually moderately active. I mean, you know, we might have more activity in the DIPG cell line. So to pick, I mean, it makes sense to go with 2009 for hint of proof of efficacy. In a in vivo model, but you need to like this type of the other candidates, and hopefully by that time somebody would be able to engraft anyone, mm -hmm. and we can actually run all of the other V compounds in an in vivo efficacy model. If not, we might be forced to pick one of those and then see with that level of in vitro activity, are we likely to see more activity in vivo? I mean, I've seen some projects like that. You know, mm -hmm. they're not very often popular, but every now and again you get some compounds actually that works best in an in vivo model because of tumor micro environment and that might work in your favor. But that's a tall shot. I mean, so for now we are doing 2009. We'll see what that looks like because these models are very long models. And you go for three months, three to four months. So we're going to take 2009 as kind of a first step. And if we're encouraged, we might be, you know, Taunted to take one of the other compounds and just test to see if that level of in vitro activity could translate into any meaningful in vivo efficacy. Do you, okay, Matt, but, do you have a, a rationale for why 2009 is so much better in the 007 line? Well, I think it, the other activity has nothing to do with alto. I think uh, it's a PIC, it, it also, um, 007 is also PIC dependent compound. Um, and does 2009 hit PI3? Do we know? Do, do we know if 2009 hits PI3? Um, uh, from the board profiling, it didn't. Mm -hmm. So, the other target that um, Alex had bought of all of these compounds, I mean, they are quite selective. There's one other target that they hit. It's called this tinic. A lot of these compounds hit tinic. Yeah. And so whether that's contributing to some of their profile, we actually haven't gotten IC50, of course, tinic for all the compounds, and maybe can, that's something we could do. But yeah, there's some other pharmacology that's probably contributing to the activity of 007 in these DIPG lines. Yeah, there is a major driver that we figure out. Yes. That would be, uh, be so is there anything that 2009 hits that the other three don't hit? Um, there's, I think, one of 2003. Do I have that in the back? Let me go back to the backup slide and see if I have. Uh, I wondered if it was any ion channels or GPCRs or something outside kinase. Mm. Okay, so these were some of the other targets from 2009, less than 50. So there was, other than the L, there was TINIC, MLTK, 6, 2, NLK. So, I mean, none of these really stand out to say, well, hey, you know, this is a strong, you know, oncogenic driver, and whether or not that's relevant to the IPG line. So, it's kind of a hard call right now. As Alex says, is there any other activity that's not kinase? Yeah. Um, Greeny. Yeah, we haven't done non kinase profiling for these yet. That's something we should probably do and gather some of that data. 
and see if some of the alien channels might be contributing. Well, that's a good point. But there does seem to be a difference between 2009 and the other compounds. Mm -hmm. You know whether there is some activity that that compound has that the other three haven't. Mm -hmm. whether, that's whether that is what the the uh, uh, the 007 cell line is more dependent on. Yeah. But like I said, they all hit Tinic really hard, and then they all hit some of the other Alks. I think they did Alk 1, Alk 6, I think, and Alk, a little bit of Alk 3, that's it. You know, but as far as the kinase, the profiles look quite decent for kinase inhibitor, I think. Um, but you're right, you probably might need to now take those and start body profiling, looking for difference and start mm -hmm. trying to figure out what about the IPG. 007, that's distinct from some of the others. <laughs> for the list, um, I was just uh, thinking about, for the list of uh, analogs that are uh, really active against uh, uh, 29, mm -hmm. uh, can we run like a correlation between anabret and... Um, see, because yeah, we could do that, we can pull the data. We have a bow probably, right? um, we've tested probably over like 40, 50 compounds. Yeah, we could run a correlation. But that's not a bad idea. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, so I mean, like I was say, if we could get the IPG in graph, that would be great. In the meantime, we are kind of left with 007, which is probably most people have experience with. Mm -hmm. It's one we can engraph also topically. We're going to run 2009 just to demonstrate that in an in vivo model, based on this in vitro data, we can actually shrink the gene. And um, yeah, we might be willing to take a risk on one of the others. If we don't get the APG21 in graph, we might pick another compound just to test to see if we have some in vivo effects. All right. And um, we'll do like somebody suggested, we'll probably do a little bit more profiling across the non-kinase systems and see if we pick up any other biology that could explain the difference. So, so with the lead compounds that we have here, now I thought it's good to start thinking about next step. What would we want to do with these? But I thought it was a good idea to just remind people of some of the things we had done with 2009 and what we're going to want to do with some of the other back other selected candidates that we just highlighted. So again, one of the key things that we found very attractive about 2009 was its linearity with dose. We had dose it at 10 up to 100 mix per kg for PK, and we see nice linearity, particularly with AUC. We had also done a quick five-day tolerability study, dosing it at 25, 50, and 100 mix per kg QD. And then we had also those 25 mix BID, so we can probably do a little bit more of those studies. But we're quite happy to see 209 was well tolerated. Okay, and we saw nice dose escalation. So those are some of the studies we want to do. The other point I wanted to make is when we started doing dose escalation, you could see what happens as we start going to some of the higher doses. You start getting, you know, BBB ratios approaching more to one. You could see there's brain and plasma, um, brain in blue, plasma in. And so one of the tests we're going to do for the lead compounds, just to make sure that we continue to, you know, hold on to that nice BBB penetration profile is to kind of, when we do the dose escalation, we'll pick the highest dose, 100 mix per kg, and then just check the BBB penetration at four hours, just to kind of cause check that we're getting decent penetration in the brain. Mm -hmm. so that's very, very important. Okay, so, so yeah, so for next step, this is what we're planning. So immediately, we have the DIPG orthotopic model, which Angel has compounds. This is a snapshot at the design. So we're actually going to run, you know, four groups. We decide to do a control with no treatment. We're going to run 2009 at 100 mix and 50 mix. Um, what am I missing? Okay, and uh, he also wanted to continue one of the groups for much longer. So the 100 mix group is going to take over for much longer. So, so that's the way he have you know, set up the design. So hopefully close to the end of August, we start getting some data trickling in about how that efficacy might be done. So really, really looking forward to 
Could he? Uh, yes, could he. And you're confident that you'll get enough uh, coverage? Yes, you? yes, yes. I mean, if you go back and look at some of the exposures we're getting, um, for, I mean, it's even here, it's in this one. So this is some of the QD and BID dosing. So you could see you're seeing up to five, six micromolar. I mean, if you can hold those kind of concentrations, and it's the same concentration in the brain. Mm. Um, and those are the same data that we actually saw for the FOP. And also those are the concentrations we saw in the brain. So hopefully with five, six micromolar, it's killing these at 130 nanomolar in vitro. Mm -hmm. Hopefully those concentrations should hold up throughout the life of the experiment and keep this tumor at bay. So I mean, this should be quite interesting over time. Um, one of the pieces of data we need to get, I mean, just to keep that in mind too, is we're going to follow up and get some um, plasma protein binding data so we can also look at, you know, free unbound mm -hmm. concentrations to see if even if the free unbound we are still well above the IC50. Yeah. So one thing on this study, Dave, that we're you know, trying to figure out is that we have 100 meg per kg data because that's all we had for maximum tolerability. We haven't really got anything out there. So we don't actually know where the tolerability, where the efficacy breakpoint is. And we don't know if this is efficacious at 25, 50, or 100. So, so the only data point we have so far is a FOP model at 100. So it might be overkill and it might not be. Yes, know. yes. No, it, it could be overkill. It may be right on the edge. I mean, I'd love to say we really know. Uh, and if you go back to, um, you know, whatever our next steps, you'll notice that the maximum tolerated dose for these things is now bumped up to 300 mg yes. per kg. Yes. Again, yes. literally we picked the 100 mg per kg because that's the only data point we yes. had um, when we did the 100 mg per kg. We expected this, this, like other uh, chemotherapies, to be much more toxic, but to date it's shown to be well tolerated at least. Mm -hmm. So anyways, so um, hopefully we'll learn more. Yeah. Maybe we'll find that we're really over the FC level 150 is close. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we'd like to find out more. Yeah, we're talking, as you know, a favor in seeing efficacy, and then yeah. after then get that dosing down. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah. So so we start. Sorry. We we did do the uh, protein and uh, brain tissue binding here at Charles River, and so you should have the data for 2009. Now, yes, yes, I know, you have that data, and so we'll get that for the other backup compounds, to be called, that might be a feature, yes. Okay, um, Okay, and um, so we get the efficacy going, I also want to highlight, um, so Chris Jones also, working closely with uh, Angel, have decided to also look at 2009 in an efficacy model, but he's planning to do the Belcher engineered model, Belcher has created these cell lines that has the histone mutations, they have PDGF amplification and R2. He can get those lines to in graph. And so he's gonna we're gonna run an efficacy model using the Belcher model. Now the key point to note, like for the patient derived the IPT007 line, I mean what I've learned from these guys is that line takes probably about a month to engraft. Whereas the engineer model takes about one to two weeks. So, I mean, that's one of the nice things. We've hopefully, with the Belcher model, we can get some early quick information. We get engraftment, and then we could see whether the compounds are working. And we can also test the backup compounds. But we're waiting on a protocol from Chris Jones, you know, in order to get this going. But he has already committed. And then we'll send him compounds right shortly thereafter. The other critical step is to scale up compounds to probably do efficacy and some of the tolerability. And so we decided that we will just make 50 grams of these four backups while we're also gathering tolerability data at the same time. Okay, um, so we're gonna do dose escalation and tolerability studies in mouse. We plan to do a very similar study to 2009, 10, 25, 50, and 100 mix for linearity. Do brain plasma ratios at four over the 100 mix, this is your partitions. We're going to do the tolerability, and now you could see, like oh, we mentioned, we have added now a 300 mg dose, just to kind of keep pushing to 009 a bit. So we plan to do a QD um, to see if that's tolerated. And now, another point we keep discussing, so now evaluating 
the picking rats because probably later on for um, toxicity rat might be the preferred species so it's good to know rat picking but what's also nice is that the hepcidin induced model that RPD model actually it seems like even though it works in mouse rats are easier to handle you can get plasma so that might be a better model to do pd in so we might want to think about doing rat picky first of those four compounds and then we now start using those to actually do the pd model because that pd might serve as a better surrogate than fop which takes a longer time so so those are some of the short term next steps for these lead compounds that we're thinking about gathering some data from. Now for the hepcidin model, I was going to reach out to you, um, Sue, I hadn't gotten a chance yet, but I mean, it looks like it's a, this hepcidin assay is a very simple assay. It looks like a simple PK assay. You dose, you can actually take serum and you can measure hepcidin. There are ways to do that. So, I mean, I don't know if that's something Charles, if I can actually, we might ask you to do a quote for it. Seems like a well established one of the mill type of assay. That for, they can for a five day study, I'll go from 100 mpk to 300 milligrams. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to add another dose? Because maybe, because if it's toxic at 300, we don't know if it's toxic at 110 mm -hmm. or 290. Mm -hmm. That's too close from the, it's too close from uh, the dose that's used to in the in the in the efficacy study. I was wondering if we can add 150. Another dose in between? Yeah, we could. I don't know, just because. We'll take a look at that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we could even, if something happens at 300, then we can step it down. That's why, yeah, because yeah, if yeah. you do so, that, you don't want to uh, repeat it again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we have time. Okay. So right now, I mean, we know we have been at 100, and we haven't reached, you know, maximum tolerated dose yet. We just said, okay, let's try 300. If we see it there, yeah, then, then we come down and we see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, and if, or if Owen feels like he has cash and we just slip the 150 in between. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's see. I mean, let's either way. Yeah, and thanks, but you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are some cash limitations on this and funding limitations on this, but we get, we just thought, and we'll have further this discussion as we get closer to it. Like, right? mm -hmm. you know, do you just mm -hmm. stop it at uh, 300 or, or do you add another dose? Or do you throw in a 10-day tolerability? Because most likely this drug will actually be used in patients on on a two-week on, two-week off. That seems as often as a common chemotherapy usage. Mm -hmm. So to uh, try and manage what might be the useful dose, it might be nice to do five-day tolerability and then do a two-week tolerability mm -hmm. uh, to to match that. Yes. So again, these are things to be discussed. Get yeah. some more feedback on, etc. Things are thinking about. Um, just go, uh, uh, Sue, yeah, uh, we have a call, I think, tomorrow at 10 a.m. our time, 6, yes. 6 p.m. your time, I think, or, um, in any event, uh, if you, we were hoping to talk to you about this turpentine-induced serum hepatocyte model, mm -hmm. um, and if you have any thoughts, et cetera, from there, uh, love to love to get them and share them. I, Alex, I think you brought up some good points last time when we were talking about this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just... So I don't know, so if I mean, you could reach out, and if this is an experiment, it can be done at Charles even, you know, such a price, I mean, they could provide us a code. But it looks like a simple PK experiment, and then you just take plasma, just like you take plasma to see compound. You can also just take that same plasma and check for um, hepcidin levels. I mean, protocols for analysis of those are well established. So. And so this might be a good surrogate, like as I say, for um, PD. Okay. Yep, okay. We'll, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll discuss look it before it. tomorrow, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, so to kind of finish up, like Owen mentioned, so the other backup candidates that we are still looking at is the blueprint compound. And so the Charles River team have done a nice job of doing a little bit of this art around some of the blueprint compound. Now, Initially, we were making some blueprint analogs, like earlier on, 3007, and we thought the lead compound might have had that cyclopropylacetyl group. But then, as they disclosed the structure for the clinical candidate, which is 785, we realized that the group attached to the papyrazine was this hydroxypyrin. I, just be, I would just be very cautious here. When I spoke to the guy from Blueprint recently, mm -hmm. it wasn't obvious whether that was actually the structure of BLU 785. But that's what they disclosed from the 
That's what they did. Oh, someone else has actually said it. That's what it is. I'm not. That was from their website. Oh, I thought it, it was not. from whoever yeah. was supplying, like Sigma. It wasn't Sigma, but it was some chemical company was just selling it. Yeah. Interesting. So they have a presentation on their website, Blueprint, okay. and that's this chapter I saw. Unless they're trying to pull a mass over eyes. Hmm, they would be the okay. first to do that. Maybe I'm wrong. But, yeah. wrong. They do have, a, if you go to their website and you look at their presentation okay. disclosures, I think okay. that's the compound I thought I saw. But I'm seeing things. You can look for patterns as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. there you can't find it. Yeah. Right. Okay, but um, yeah, that's something. If that's not the right structure, yeah, we need to check on what that is. But now we had 300 megs of it made, and so you know, for 3007, the earlier compound, we had concerns about its BBB penetration. So now we knew what the now we knew what, now we think we know what the structure of the clinical compound is. This is that one we had it made. Now we're gonna get um, out to data. It's being sent out. And also, we're going to get BBB penetration for it to see. And we'll be able to compare it to some of the data. So um, I've sent those compounds out for um, PKM and BBB penetration. And I'll just give the team the update when that data comes in. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, another point that I know I wanted to just remind the team again is here. So these compounds actually, so far, the 7, 8, and 7, 9 had decent R to potency. Nanobreath looks decent. The activity in the DIPD 21 line, which we think is R2 dependent, looks decent. As I said, there's quite a disconnect between the 007 line. So you don't see any activity in the 007 line, convincing us more and more that that's probably not an R2 gym phenomenon. So just keep that in mind for the series. So I mean, if we do get 21 in graphs, then these would be ideal to put in that model. The one difference there might be the histone mutation is different in 007, but how that would impact on out 2 is unknown. No, yes, yes. Okay, so, and again, I like to remind the group again, the competitive landscape as we continue to keep track. So there is this, um, TIP084 compound. I mean, these are the compounds that I pulled from a pattern. Okay, we don't know exactly what the structure is yet, but some of those features are in some of the best compounds in the pattern. There's the blueprint. Also, there's BioQuest. They haven't disclosed a clinical compound yet in terms of structure, but the clinical compound, the preclinical compound that they're talking about is this 90 to 50. No structure is disclosed, but there's a representative structure from their pattern. And that recent pattern that um, Sue had sent to us, with the Novartis clinical compounds based on the Pyridium series. So we continue to keep an eye out for those as we go forward. And so basically now, like as I said, just to keep the group abreast of where we are, so we are targeting, you know, for this grant, finishes up at, in November. Hopefully we'll get some more funds to do some of the sub-November studies with some of the late compounds. But we're hoping to at least get M4K2009. So that's going to start in terms of DIPG efficacies. Um, we're hedging our bets if we can even get a second compound in, but you know, we can stay optimistic. But I'm hoping we can get some rat picket then to kind of help some of the pity. Mm -hmm. And then from that, we decide if we have enough cash to want to do dog picket and a little bit of tolerability in rats. I mean, so closer to the end. We may be able to get some of that in. If not, we kind of just push it after when we raise funds beyond the uh, November timeline. Okay, so I think we're on a good run right now. I think the project is in a very, very good place. And so I'm anxious to see what sort of efficacy we're going to get. Okay, so I mean, that's kind of an overview of how we went about selecting compounds. We start off with some of the backups are. Um, if people have strong suggestions of compounds that we missed, all these is that should be in the mix. Feel free and let us know. Okay. Um, any other questions, suggestions, recommendations? Yeah. Kill all the contacts. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Is it, is it blue seven eight two or seven eight five? Um. I thought it was seven eight two. 
Okay, that could be a typo on my part. Um, okay, let me go back and check that. Yeah, you could be right. Yeah, that could be, it might be seven, or maybe it's the, it's a PDGF compound, might be seven, eight, five. Yeah, let me go back and check that. You could be right. Yeah, that could be a typo on my part. Okay, if there are no other questions, then let's go on to Alex's update. Um, it's 782? Yeah, you're right, Alex. It's 782. That's my typo. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, should I go to full screen or leave it on? Okay, let's try that and see. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, we're still seeing your presenter view rather than okay. wide view. Okay, which one do you prefer? Full screen or off? I mean, it doesn't matter? Probably the full screen. Yeah, okay. I have it on full screen here. Um, they were saying if you try and do it on my laptop, that might cause problems. So. And what I mean is we're seeing two slides at once in presenter mode. Go back to the same format that you had for the other. Yeah, this one? That's better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. But we're seeing the wrong slide deck now. Yep. We're seeing chemistry. Oh. Wow. That's really should I close the chemistry one? Oops. Should I say screen sharing has stopped? No, you don't want to do that? You can yeah, no, stop and restart. Yeah, just press OK and then go share in the middle. And then choose the screen that you want to share. Um, which is this? Uh, just the, the one with below the green. Below the green. Where are you? Yeah. Right there. Yeah. How is that? That's better. Okay. Right. You're unmuted. Okay. Young Fu is going to present. Okay. Okay. Hi. Thanks, thanks, Mathman. Yeah, so, uh, I'll, I'll start. So uh, before this, um, just an, an introduction again, like reminder. So uh, with um, with all three these three uh, the IPG lines that I'm showing, um, they are all having uh, out two mutation, which causes them to be uh, responsive to a neural ligand um, activin A, and for wild type out two. Um, they do not usually signal um, when activate um, when treated with um, activin A, and as for BMP7 and BMP4, they um, activate both um, the mutated ALK2 as well as wild type ALK2, and mm -hmm. we ask uh, for uh, TGF beta, um, none of either the wild type or the mutant ALK2 would uh, respond to it. So uh, the the thinking is that. Um, in all of the culture as well as the uh, viability experiments, the DIPG cells have been ca um, kept in um, the culture medium without any of these ligands. So uh, the, the medium is um, formulated to maintain a neural stem cell um, kind of culture. So uh, there's one um, concern that whether um, addition of the ligand would actually change um, the growth pattern of the of the DFPG cells. So I've uh, done a small a small experiment to test that out, uh, where I titrated um, different concentration of the different uh, ligand, and um, in, in, and just look at the growth of the cells um, for uh, seven days. And um, initially, before the experiment, um, I was suspecting that um, I might see like promoted or increased growth, um, increased viability of the cells. But surprisingly, actually not. Um, uh, in fact, actually high concentration of uh, the uh, ligand that uh, activates the mutant um, out to, uh, especially in the um, 
the IPG21, um, which is um, very much dependent on uh, R2, um, actually compromise the viability of the cells. Yeah, but um, this also confirms that our previous um, viability experiment um, it is not problematic. So before or without um, the, the ligand, it's probably not uh, critical to the viability of the cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, can move, move on to the next slide. So, so uh, in the next slide, I do notice that um, in one of us trial experiment with M4K two thousand nine, uh, when I treated um, the DRPG number four um, with it, um, in the absence of acti activin A, it seems that um, there are more self death, like slight increase in, in the potency of 2009. So that would be like one um, curiosity that I, I would um, just try to follow up on to see um, what might be the reason. But also this confirms that um, it is just not um, an issue in the metabolic activity in terms of like the, because the cell type glows detects um, it determines the viability based on the amount of ATP. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, in this slide, I'm using uh, staining um, for the um, DNA, which directly detects um, dead cells. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can move on to the next slide. So so next, um, I did some experiment on the M4K2241 which is fused to uh, a different uh, uh, group that's supposed to recruit um, E3 ligases. And so I've, um, in, and in, in this experiment, I use um, R2 fused to nano luciferase as a surrogate to uh, the R2 level. So when, when, when the protein, when the fusion protein is degraded, then I, I will see a de decrease in the luciferase as, um, activity. And in this, I've done the experiment in several um, in several conditions where uh, without any treatment or with uh, MG132, which uh, inhibits the proteosomal degradation, as well as um, addition of like cyclohexamide to stop uh, protein production uh, during the period of SA. So, and I've treated uh, the cells with a titration of the M4K2241. And um, it's, it's like, it's, potentially degrading out to, and it seems that the degradation is not mainly through a direct proteosomal degradation. And I think that might be um, common to um, proteins that are, are embedded in the membrane, uh, re for example, receptors. So it is possible that the main degradation is through um, endosomal, lysosomal degradation. And because um, when I checked um, previously in the uh, R2 nanoprot assay, uh, it seems that the IC50 for uh, M4K2241 is, is quite a bit lower compared to the parent 2009. Um, cool. It was in uh, around 2000 uh, nanomolar. We just have yeah. to back one step here in that we don't know that this protein is getting ubiquitinated at all, mm -hmm. you know, so we missed that evidence. So it's probably too early to jump to. Yeah, yeah. Too much. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I shouldn't over in, in, interpret this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and uh, I, I have also included it in um, some viability essay, and seems to be um, not efficacious. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I mean, these are some experiments you have to do because, like, you know, I'm just also looking at some nanobit data for um, this. IRAP4 inhibitor that has a very, very polar AMI from um, Pfizer recently. And you could see, they find that some of the peg linkers were a little bit too polar. So even though they were getting good biochemical activity, mm -hmm. then the cellular activity was quite shifted. So they went to more lipophilic linkers. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the things to think about. I know Sue and her group is probably also thinking 
of some of the approaches to nano red, not nano red, um, protac. And again, we could start exploring some of the um, other AT ligases, the VHL and stuff. So, I mean, this is a good start. I mean, we might probably need to make some more lipophilic ligand to get better cellular data. Yeah, but I think it's going to be important if we find a ligand that's, you know, potent and give us good cellular data. These tools are going to help us really determine which alg line is truly alg to dependent to degradation. So this might definitely be a worthwhile effort. And I mean, we'll, we'll discuss some of this with um, Sue tomorrow. So mm -hmm. they interested in devoting some effort to this, too, which I think is important. Thank you. This is oh, yeah, maybe we can move on to the next slide. The last slide, actually. And, and here I'm, I'm just uh, briefly showing some of the compound, uh, the recent compound that are having a potency of like below 100 nanomolar in the L2 nanobread uh, assay. And yeah, um, yeah the, um, the ones with the replacement at the trimetoxy site, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as the um, FOK uh, 2095. But uh, I do notice that even though the potency is really high in that, but it has really low uh, solubility though, that I notice um, insoluble specs even at um, 10 millimolar in DMSO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and the uh, out 5 uh, dual luciferase assay IC50 is uh, in, in progress now. I'll, I'll, I'll send, send the data to you all uh, once I get them. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. So thank great. you. All right. Thanks. So yeah. just one thing would be interesting to see whether active and sensitizes some of these other compounds that are only sensitive on the DIPG, the 007. Seven? Mm. To see if maybe you could expand the output phenotype. You know that? Um, I was just thinking um, if active is uh, sensitizing which one? Um, and K42009 in slide two, maybe it would be interesting to uh, look at some of these other cell, these other compounds that are only active in the DIPG21 um, line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good suggestion. All right. Any other questions for Jean Fu? Any suggestions? If not, Yep, so those are the updates for today. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, good progress in terms of, you know, compound selection from lead and backup. I mean, we continue to gather data. We're going to meet with her tomorrow, have some discussions about some of her plans for the project. We'll discuss some of this possibility of running the HEP site in Mon at Charles River. Okay, and hopefully start getting some efficacy data in the near term. You know, to everybody come back from some other location mm -hmm. and actually get efficacy data. That's mm -hmm. a good way to finish this up. Mm -hmm. What is the date of the next meeting? The next meeting is, oh, I didn't, let's see if it's uh, really good. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, Our next meeting? 7th of August. 7th? Yeah. What are you thinking? No, I was just trying to remember the holidays, which, yeah. which day is Canada Day, et cetera, so we're having staff as well. Are you honest? Get the next meeting and then come back in the school day? Um, no, I think that it's a possibility we'll review it, but I think uh, it would be interesting to see if we can get um, so We will have some progress, I think, on where we are with these four compounds, yeah. emphasis around them, um, planning for the remaining experiments yeah, we want to do between yeah. now and November, uh, possibly an update from Chris Jones, and, and I'd like to find out. Um, uh, from the fellow uh, uh -huh. uh, with regards to the Alzheimer's and yes. you know, maybe yes. if he can just present Next to the group the scientifically what his experiment is and what's the basis for his thought, that might yes. be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's for, for next month. It would be nice if he could present yeah. to that line as well. To... Okay, if not, thanks everyone. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's Ben. Uh, uh, final question from Oxford. Um, what is the Current plan for chemistry. I'm just thinking of you know workflow here. Um, are there going to be more batches of compounds that will keep Zhong Fu busy in those assays, or do you have different priorities for us? You know, just thinking of what what should be the Oxford priorities. 
I mean, so I think it's probably just a small, like, they're going to be trickling in. They won't be plenty of compound like before. We probably are. We're planning on making some analogs around the, you see the Novartis compound that they use in the hepcidin model. With our finding of cyano and methyl on that core, we'll probably make those analogs and see if they get any better. Um, the scale of compounds that come in, probably those batches we're going to want, make sure we check those and make sure everything is still hunky dory with those. So, not going to be as intense. They're going to be compound cycling here and there, but I'll probably give you the heads up when they're coming. Um, I don't know. I'm going to talk to Sue tomorrow in terms of, you know, what's the flux of analogs coming from them. So, so other than that, it's not going to be crazy like before, but there might be a few compounds cycling in here and there. So we'll, we'll continue to be making compounds, probably at the same ah. rate as we have been, but for the moment anyway. Great. Okay. Yeah, I think that's where the bulk of the compounds are going to come from. Charles yes, River. yes, for the back. Did that help? Yeah, okay. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great right. day. Thanks okay. a lot. Bye. Okay, no problem. Uh, so